We're really lucky today on, on September 11th to be here in Oceanside, right at the front door of Camp Pendleton where myself and Amy and Fred, we've, we've all spent time there and we're, we're equally as lucky to have our moderator tonight, uh, Robert, join us who is not only a fellow author but an acclaimed journalist and documentarian and has traveled the world to so many conflict zones and at dinner last night I was comparing Robert to some of my other favorites who didn't wear a uniform. Uh, greats who have jumped in into journalism and filmmaking and shared really important stories of our nation's warriors and those that do put on the uniform because people like Robert who came down when we asked him to join this panel tonight, he said it sounds like something really cool. And because Robert, like many others, have put a lot of skin in the game to go over and report and cover stories of Marine soldiers who are doing the fighting, but also risk. So those definitions to words like risk and sacrifice and caring and, and love aren't exclusive to any one organization. Everybody has that capacity to do all those things, and Robert is absolutely one of them. And, and, I, and I appreciate you for being here tonight, my friend. So please, a round of applause for our moderator. I'll let Robert do the rest of the introductions, but before we do that, I also want to say uh, about the, the reason we're here tonight is to take a, a moment to also remember the occasion and this milestone of the 21st anniversary of September 11th and the thousands who died on this day 21 years ago and the thousands more that have died fighting to defend this country some of whom live right here at this gate and are memorialized in Amy's wonderful work. And I think it's especially important that we as a community come together in places like this and just take a minute to remember why we're here and why we're so lucky to be hanging out on a, on a theater on a, on a Sunday night when there are no theaters in some of the places we fought. There are no book signings going on. Those things don't exist. And I think as Americans, whenever we have the opportunity to remind people, I'm very unabashed to smack America in the face, the other 99%, to make them remember that we don't always have it this great. And 21 years ago, when those planes slammed into that concrete and steel, it also ripped a huge hole, not only in those buildings, but the heart of our country. And I think that we are quick to forget but if we rewind two decades and a year, we always remember how unifying that was. And to this day, with everything going on in the political and social landscape as it is, I think we do need to constantly be reminded that America is always at its best when we are united as a country. And you coming out here on a Sunday night shows that to me. And part of the great aspect of you showing up here and, and joining us to talk about our perspectives through three completely different lenses that we've experienced war in Afghanistan and Iraq and around the world is also not about solely what we did. Uh, I'm always quick to not want to talk about things I did or my 24 years in the Marine Corps and all the countries. I always want to talk about what we're doing now. And my friends here are committed, like I am, to continue to serve and to continue to give back. And that's why your ticket purchase alone tonight helps support one great nonprofit that I'm very proud to be the executive director of, SaveTheBrave.org. And for the last seven years, we've been connecting veterans in a safe space through outreach programs. And it started, like many things, born through tragedy when one of my squad leaders, who I write about in my book, Simon Lickie, killed himself. And he was this young... God, he was this Bradley Cooper looking kid, you know, just had everything going for him and none of us saw it coming. And we, we got the news and we threw some money together and we flew a bunch of guys to Minnesota to support that family. And since then, we said, we're going to do more and we took guys fishing. And that was seven years ago. Last year, we did 32 offshore fishing trips and serviced over 220 veterans in California, Texas, and in Florida. So as we continue to grow, what you are doing by coming here tonight and listening to us and engaging with us in this conversation, you're making a difference. And you're, you're absolutely making an impact in the lives of veterans. And all of us here 
our veterans in, in one way, shape, or form. So tonight's not just about hearing some of our stories of, of three combat veterans who've been outside the wire, but it's also about supporting a great veteran nonprofit, SaveTheBrave.org. So if you don't do it now, but please, at some point or before you leave or before you go to bed tonight, go to SaveTheBrave.org and please make a donation. Give 60 bucks a year or 10 bucks a month. It's less than a tank of gas when you put things in perspective. Not even in California anymore, but please, uh, what you do and what you give really makes a difference. We are 100% nonprofit. Thank you. No, we're, very, we're very proud of that fact that 100% goes back to veteran programs, and none of us on the board for the past seven years have taken a single dime for salary. And it's something we're very proud of, but we also know that it could not do what we do without the support from people like you. So I want to say thank you again for coming out tonight. I want to say thanks for everybody showing up here and being part of this. And without any further ado, Robert, over to you, my friend. Thank you very much. Um, quite a motivational speaker he is. Um, I'm here because I enjoy doing things like this, and I think it's important to let people tell stories because ultimately, as humans, that's what we have, our stories. Uh, my connection to 9-11 is, is very simple. Um, I've been covering conflicts since the mid-90s. I was in Afghanistan very early on uh, with the Special Forces team and a guy named General Dostum. And they were doing exactly what America wanted to do, which was to eliminate the Taliban and overthrow that regime. Uh, they, and along with the Air Force and Air Power, did it very quickly and very efficiently. And you would think that's the end of the story. But <clears throat> what happened was um, this special forces group came to me and said, you know, there's much more to what's going to happen than uh, the public knows. And one of the things that was quite disturbing is that when the media arrived and started writing stories about our reaction to 9-11, it wasn't so much that the Afghans were lined up on the hills cheering and crying and throwing money uh, because the press had missed that. It was, why did you kill all these Taliban? And, and there was a story started by a certain journalist, who Fred will probably fill you in on, about a massacre, about people being put in containers and then suffocated and buried in a remote grave, which was completely fictitious because I was there at the prison and during all the fighting. And for the first time, I saw something change to the public. In other words, I saw what was there, I documented it, I did a documentary, I wrote about it. But suddenly a story was being told that we did something wrong. And I say we, America, responded to a horrific incident and suddenly we had to defend ourselves for what we were doing. So it's absolutely critical that the people who were involved in what we call the war on terror document accurately, truthfully, and faithfully what they did and what they saw. And, and the first author I'd like to talk to you about his experiences is Fred. And Fred is not known for coming from a very chatty, talkative uh, group, but he has 27 years in the Marines, and he did his time in Iraq. And he was also the victim of that re-narrating of a story. And what I'd like to do is ask him some simple questions. Uh, we're going to do this for an hour, and then we're going to go out in the lobby, and you can ask your own questions to the authors. And, and uh, if we miss something here, uh, feel free to buttonhole them. But let me start uh, by asking a simple question. Fred, when you went into the war on terror, and when you look back on what you did, was it what you expected it to be? Uh, when we first started, the very first uh, deployment, both as an enlisted Marine from mm -hmm. here in Camp Pendleton uh, for Desert Storm, as well as mm -hmm. uh, our first deployments in the war on terror, we're both out of here in Camp Pendleton. And we had across our nation you know, this unity. Yeah. Uh, everyone was focused on that. Uh, obviously with Desert Storm, very quick results, very positive. America became very patriotic overnight. Uh, Iraq, there was some, uh, well, I should say after 9-11 that we had the unity before going into Iraq, there was some division and that became amplified. It became amplified uh, through many like Nick's 
from the media, some of that was internal, and uh, <clears throat> you see over the years how that's been amplified. Um, but you know, you're taking actually live footage. Uh, we saw just over a year ago uh, several Afghan citizens dangling from a Air Force C-17 mm -hmm. uh, to their death. You know, that, that strikes a chord in, in most Americans as far as how is our military handling this? This is, you know, we thought after 20 years there wouldn't be a situation like this repeated from uh, Vietnam. So we started off very strong and uh, without getting into a lot of politics and uh, personal thoughts, uh, you know, there was a change in strategy in the 2006 time frame. And uh, as I was talking to one of the Marines today that I served with, you know, he completely out of the Marine Corps, but he saw, hey, right after he left the Marine Corps, it started to deteriorate, and it did. And that was due to a change in our policy. And it also began to, especially more so in Afghanistan, there was uh, information warfare that was uh, after, I'm sure you remember Mr. Pearl, uh, his tragic situation. Mm. Uh, many media sources began to employ members of the media who were embedded, but also some that were in the local environment. Uh, some referred to them as stringers who were in, when you're in a village that's controlled by the Taliban, that is very likely to become propaganda. Mm -hmm. And that becomes very divisive when that's in the Western media source and that's in, uh, like our friend, she was in the New York Times. Um, and they continue to amplify this and it, it spreads to other sources and it really is becomes very destructive. So personally, uh, the lives of, uh, in this particular case, seven United States Marines who were, were falsely accused of war crimes, it, uh, it becomes something that when there is no final end state, no resolve, uh, there is, we're a legal society and we have laws and when there's no legal terms utilized at the end of a court case, this is the longest this is a nonfiction story, A Few Bad Men, this is the longest war crimes trial in the Marine Corps history uh, coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, the largest accusation of 69 wounded and killed Afghan civilians. They, what every nation on this globe and every religion on the planet condemn, uh, murdering women, children, elderly. Uh, that is something that there needs to be finality. Uh, and I'm not just talking about comparing it to last year, how we fumbled the withdrawal. I'm talking about a case of what we tell Marines when they enter recruit training or officer training, that we take care of our own leadership. We get the mission done. And in that mission, we did on our end at the front line level, we got it done. But when we expect that leadership to take care of their Marines and you won't even end the case in legal terms, uh, or you try to dodge the question. And unfortunately, the, the institution that I loved and that I still love, and I just left serving as a civilian four and a half months ago, uh, and it is important, and right now more so than ever in American history, that we have our strong, competent national defense. But the, uh, the issue is, no, I, I realize that when we don't use legal terms, and you just allow people to go back to work with this black cloud hanging over their head, the, the psychological damage that that happens to, to their families and, and how they went about in an attempt uh, utilizing the threat of deport, deporting legalized citizens that, that weren't sure of their full citizenship. Well, you That's, became the enemy, it sounds like, from, yes. from my read of a book. Um, you know, they have a saying that America has an attention span of 90 days for a war, so you better get in, get out. 20, 20 years later, I don't know how many stories we've told, but what, what you're telling through your book is that as, as a legitimate member of the United States military, I did my job legally and professionally. And my men did it, and we did it repeatedly. And if somebody broke the law, they were brought up on charges. But there's another narrative that creeps in and begins to take over and minimize the people who are on the ground. And so this, this is what I got from your book, is that you have to go back to the source. You have to read the specifics, the dates, the times, the personalities. 
to, to make sure you get the narrative right, because yes. I, I think we spend too much time criticizing what we did in Afghanistan, when in actual fact we were there to help Afghanistan. We weren't there to fix everything, pave every road, and build every building. We were there to get them on their feet and leave them. Right? Um, you know, we're short on time, but I, I want people to understand this is an excellent book. It's, it's a bit of a sad book, because I know people's love for the core and the idea of serving their country can get crushed by this giant machine that you never created, but you're thinking, why me? I'm, I'm the good guy. Right? So I'm, by all means, please uh, pick it up and read it. I'm going to shift to Amy. Now, Amy's job was to communicate what the Marines do and to help journalists understand what the fight was about, uh, get irritating people like me into the country, get me focused this way, not that way, and not do, do bad things, and then hopefully get out alive. She's written a book. It's a very proud book about the Marines, and if everything falls over, don't blame me. Um, it's got a lot of great photographs. It's got a lot of history. But what Amy brings back is the culture of Camp Pendleton, the fact that many, many young men left from this place to fight many wars. And I'm just going to ask her, if, uh, if you haven't noticed, you're, you're a female. You work <laughs> in a predominantly male organization. Uh, you must have had a, a more of a challenge telling the story of the Marines than let's say a Marine would. And um, yeah. tell me about your love for the Marines and why you wrote this book. Well, thank you, Robert. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, it's really a great source of pride to me to come back to a place where I was stationed for many years and I, it was my job to tell the story of the Marines and really share the courage it takes to wear a uniform, kit up, go forward and serve in a combat zone and um, serve our nation wherever it may be. Uh, when I came back here about two years ago, I noticed that there was many memorials and tributes to the Marines over the past 20 years. And it was around August, last August, I was putting the finishing touches on the book. And then, of course, the last days of our, of our uh, work in Afghanistan, the Marines from Camp Pendleton were, were hit the hardest. And within hours, flowers and memorials started flooding the front gate just to show tribute to, to that. But the community here is second to none when it comes to supporting our Marines. But through the years of telling the story and sharing the courage, and you really have to love the Marine Corps in order to put aside all of the other things that um, go wrong or that are not right and really focus on those young troops who come in with the best of intentions and are, you know, a heart the size of Texas in order to serve. And um, really, it's always an uphill battle in order to gain the trust to tell the story properly. And I mentioned this earlier today, we were at Barnes and Noble, is that as a woman, that can be contrary to what the Marine Corps is really all about. It's a machine built for men, but I've been so fortunate and just being honest and open about um, the work. And I've really had great support with a little bit of hesitation occasionally. But if I can get out there with a camera and tell the story, that gains people's trust. And so with this book of rolling up some history of Camp Pendleton and then really documenting some names that you've heard before, like First Sergeant Brad Castle, or you know, in the book I've got an excerpt and a vignette from a Navy Cross recipient and some other people that you've heard about in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. But in my research, I also learned that more Marines from Camp Pendleton were killed and injured from right here during Iraq and Afghanistan than any other one base or station in the country through the wars because the base is geographically aligned to the Middle East. And so it makes sense that our combat, operation, combat operating forces are from right here at Camp Pendleton. So that's a heavy burden for one community in America to sustain. But it's not just the past 20 years, but ever since 1942, that uh, Camp Pendleton has been supplying and training troops for World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and then this past generation. But it was 80 years ago, marks the uh, 80th anniversary when Marines from San Diego marched up here, a three-day march, set up base camp. And so the base has that long-standing legacy of training for amphibious operations. And in one chapter, I, I noticed if these hills could talk, so the hills of Camp Pendleton is where the blood, sweat, and tears have come out from many young Americans who will then face 
some of the toughest challenges of their life. So when they leave from Camp Pendleton, they have their last meal here in Oceanside or Carlsbad before they go on deployment and return, return home to uh, maybe an empty home or a family that's waiting for them. But it really is, has been home away from home for many of these um, young service members. So. so we're used to the Navy SEALs, which I think Bookdales are baked into the training program. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen the movies. <laughs> do, you, do you think the Marines get their story told to the public. What's your opinion about that? You know, we do the best we can, but I, I do think that the legacy and some of these stories often go untold. It's because of by, de by design that only certain people are allowed to tell that narrative. And so with books like Echo and Ramadi and A Few Bad Men is that true voices from real people with real stories can get told because oftentimes there's a desire to control that narrative and make sure that only certain things are are ex told and so and I've been a part of that machine as well for many years but um, sharing the courage it takes to wear uniform and the great sacrifices of these young Americans that come from all parts of, of our country yeah. uh, really put it on the line and they know what they're getting into well, I remember the early days as James Jones and some of the World War II writers had these incredible stories about being in combat that became incredible movies. Um, it'd be nice to see more of that because I know Marines usually get the worst part of the combat. They usually suffer among the highest casualties and they actually write the least number of books, which is kind of interesting. So I guess they just suck it up and move on. <laughs> which brings us to Scott. Now, Scott has written a book and it's quite a good book. It is about his time in Ramadi, which was an ugly job. And if anybody knows about Fallujah and Ramadi, those were, I guess, rabbit warrens of terrorist cells. And uh, they made a, sniper, a Navy SEAL sniper movie that was better about that. But anyway, the point is, is that this is the kind of story that we need to read more about. And that is what Marines do on a day-to-day -day basis, how they think, how they feel, how they're affected by it. And Scott is very active in helping Marines deal with the post, you know, core uh, transition and also some of the impacts of extreme violence being applied in combat. So I just want to ask you something. Um, when you sat down to write this book, was it cathartic for you? Was, was it emotional? Did it make you change the way you viewed yourself or you just type it out and send it to the publisher and be done? No, it wasn't. <laughs> I get asked that question often. It's a great question. Uh, it, it wasn't some catharsis as a as an artist and, and being creative my whole life and as a writer, which is a very portable medium. Uh, you can do it anywhere. I, I wrote the story to first and foremost honor the service and sacrifice of the young men and women in most in some cases that fought alongside of me and the families that supported us, not just while we fought, but that still support us to this day. I'm, I'm surrounded by. Um, these amazing people. I, I don't know how they do it. People that can lose so much and they, they continue to love us. They call us and they, they say, hey, I saw you're doing this and you're always traveling, you're doing this and this feedback I get. That's the real catharsis is you pour a year or more of your life into 300 pages and you hang it in Amazon and Barnes and Noble for the entire world to read and every time you go out and, and talk about it, you pick that scab up and, and you're willing to bleed a little bit for everybody. And I always share that, not for any form of sympathy, but because it's important to understand people like Fred, no one goes to boot camp here in San Diego. Any, any of the Marines out here, no one signs up and says, I'm gonna go stand in the yellow footprints and someday I wanna get court-martialed and then have to defend my Marines and write a bestseller. No one ever thinks about that when they're getting ironed out by their drill instructors. Trust me, you're thinking of more simplistic things. But what Fred has done and what I did was to understand that as a leader, there's no expiration date on your commission as an officer or an NCO. Whatever level you lead at, leadership is for a lifetime. But there's also certain people like you and Amy as well that have a capacity to share those stories. 
and I don't think that any of us, certainly not me or, or the friends close to me, do it for any sort of glory or fame or celebrity or anything that is associated with being a, an author or being in the public space. We do it because there are people out there that do not have that capacity. They don't understand how to articulate their experiences to do that. And Fred can understand this, and Amy can too, because we were all officers, but we were also enlisted as well. So we're Mustangs. And for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a horse of a couple different breeds. And we bear that uh, title with great pride from the young Marines who call us Mustang officers because we were enlisted and then became officers. But our capacity to deal with that trauma of what we saw in combat and in Ramadi in 2006 is not hyperbole that it was the deadliest city in Iraq. We lost more Marines and sailors in Ramadi than any other city in the country at the time. It was really the bloodiest fighting we'd seen. It redefined what urban combat had become to our generation. And we were fighting not when or if, but what time, how many times a day, five, six, seven times a day in direct close combat with a very well-trained insurgent force. And before we crossed that line of departure, as the commander in charge of over 250 Marines and sailors, I had to look at those sea of sturdy faces, most 18, 19, 20 years old, and I had to order them to kill. Because I never ever wanted that young Marine who was 20 years old to hesitate when he had to make that life-changing decision to put that rifle in his shoulder, look through the scope, take his weapon off safe, pull the trigger and take another human life because that is something that is not natural. Combat is not natural. Taking someone else's life, taking another human life is not a natural act. It's something that we're trained for and that we do because Marines are great at a lot of things. Shooting the rifle straighter than anybody else on the planet. Way better than SEALs, by the way. <laughs> but they also follow orders. And I knew when I looked at those young men and I ordered them to kill, it was because I wanted them to do it because I was ordering them to, not because it was a, a, a survival instinct, but it was what they're great at. And I wanted that burden to be mine because I was a 35 year old captain. I'd already had a bunch of combat deployments and had traveled the world and I had the experience. So it really begged the question as I transitioned out of the Marine Corps for so many years and I go to so many states and Texas, well, why does anybody ever say he's got a heart as big as California, by the way? <laughs> it is a big state, but. We do a lot of work in Texas with a lot of veteran organizations, but I think back to that when people ask me that question, was it a catharsis? The, the real transformational piece for me is, again, not about what I did, but what we're doing now to help these guys. And I think as a 35-year-old, my ability to compartmentalize all of that trauma was vastly different than a kid who 18 months before was probably playing high school football and how he dealt with all that trauma on a daily basis, multiple times a day. And oh, by the way, he's probably thinking about his girlfriend half the time anyway, and trying to keep his ass alive in one of the deadliest cities on the planet. So uh, that's, that's, that's how I've managed to continue to try and energize those that not only fought under my command, who has privilege to lead, because back then they took care of each other and me better than anything I've ever experienced in my life. And I wouldn't be here today if, if it wasn't for those young guys. And uh, I, I, I owe my life to them. So let me ask another question. You're, you're a multimedia kind of guy, so you do podcasts, you give speeches, um, you write books. What is the single most effective way to reach the next generation of Marines? Another great question. I think it's by one sharing those stories and, and also being uh, forward thinking. I don't ever consider myself a generationalist. I never want to be one of those guys where they say that old man Husing, uh, he's such a grouch. He, he, you're a self-proclaimed grouch and I know you, you say it tongue in cheek, but you're also a great storyteller. And I think that I, I don't want to be one of those guys that said I walked uphill both ways to school in the snow and you got it so easy and these young kids. I love Gen X. I love Gen Z. I love millennials. I love all these younger generations. And, and I always am quick to remind people, you, you know, you fall off the stage and break your nose. Guess who the doctor is in the emergency room patching you up? He's a millennial. 
or she's a millennial. So if you don't take those opportunities to share not just the wins and the victories in life, but what I've found has been helpful to me is really ripping it open and sharing the failures and everything that, that I did wrong. And I tell people that, and I'm in a position where I'm able to do that because you know, as the oldest guy here up on the stage, you gain a lot more wisdom and it comes through experience and listening. And you're able to give that tempered guidance to younger generations and really tell them, like, I failed often. I, I did, even as a leader. And we were talking about this recently is a lot of people have regrets or they talk about regrets that they have in combat or the things that they did or saw and the, the horrors of humanity that's exposed on the battlefield day in and day out. But it was really recently talking to a friend who wrote an amazing book. Uh, he, he actually was one of my soldiers and it's called Where Cowards Go to Die. And Ben Sledge wrote this book. And it really made me think as I was talking to him, it's really what we've omitted to do in some cases. I think that really binds people up. It's that photo I didn't take. I should have done this. I should have done more of this. And I think it's that accumulation of, you could call it regret or pick a word of your choice, but a lot of people focus on the things they physically saw or had to do or the, the people they killed or the explosions. But I think for a lot of people, the moral injury is really, I wish I'd have done more. And it's not necessarily the loss of life or your, your fellow Marines and soldiers that die alongside of you, but it's those things that, man, I wish I could go back and do it again. Because I, 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 I think that a lot. And I think that sharing those with the younger generation is probably the most important gift that you can give. All right, just quickly. Uh, so Fred, what is the thing that the Marine Corps gave you that you would tell a young person is, is a priceless gift? Uh, <clears throat> so right now, what I talk to a lot of the folks you know, currently at work is having that long, long-term vision. Explain is, what you do for a job, just so they understand. Okay, you do training. Yes, I'm uh, in charge of Tesla's training program for North America and Asia Pacific. Small job. And, uh, it's busy. Uh, but a lot of people can talk about what Scott just mentioned, see a failure and, you know, almost become paralyzed uh, by that. And uh, it's, it's necessary, and what the Marine Corps taught is to have a, a long-term vision, a faith that includes that you will need to accept loss. Uh, that's what a leader has to do is that's that needs to be baked into your planning and in your execution is that you're going to come across these obstacles. They're, they're going to be painful, um, but you have to have that long-term vision. And you also have to understand that, um, you know, we have a lot of traditions, a lot of pride in the Marine Corps, uh, but there's been failures in, in the Marine Corps and a leader has to, you know, continue to, you know, wear that mask and, and continue to drive the, the fight. And, we have it every day when we're training people on uh, machinery, equipment. You know, some people, there, there's a fear of, you know, going up seven stories, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just suspended, you know, on a platform with a tether. Uh, it's, it's not fun and not normal for <clears throat> the average rank and file. So you have to explain that, uh, okay, there's going to be enough for repetition, but you're going to be trained on doing this. And you know, there's going to be several stages in that training, and that's what the Marine Corps, you know, provided, you know, world-class training, and that's uh, something that I learned down in San Diego when I was a recruit, up here in Camp Pendleton, and the different duty stations is, you know, having that confidence from instructors that were very, very capable, and uh, one of them is, is here, about ready to retire uh, later this week, uh, but we do, in the Marine Corps, train uh, those Marines I believe better than any other force in the United States, hands down. Uh, it is very precise, and <clears throat> the product that comes on the outside of that is, uh, is, is, is extremely mature. And one of the things, and then I'll shut up, uh, it led me as a young Marine, I wanted to be able to count and, and have more than just okay, this person seems undependable. And that's what drove me into the force reconnaissance community and later into the Marine Special Operations community. And that level of training was, was so high. And that's, you know, I, I see that with our leader at, at Tesla as somebody that has that vision, that passion that, you know, will give everything that, you know, just like 
an instructor out there in Yuma, they measured their, not in years, but in hours. That was their metric of, you know, experience and then their qualifications. And, you know, you see a Tesla, somebody looks at the measurement of output, you know, their metric is in joules and like energy that you put into that. It's got to be very focused and very effective. Um, not every job in the world thinks like that. And it's a, but a lot of that, uh, those lessons from the Marines were, are, are extremely valuable. And we're, we're developing a manual, just like I learned from the, the Marine Corps uh, on the aviation side, uh, training and readiness, how to train people, how to make sure you're measuring them through strict evaluations that they're gonna be effective. We learned that in the Marine Corps. That's what we're building at Tesla. Uh, so awesome. hopefully you'll have the best reliable product and safest car. This isn't a paid Excellent. advertisement. But. So Amy, what did the Corps give you and what did you take away from it that you'd like to communicate to the next Marines out there? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, perseverance is one thing. Um, you know, I've always never taken no for an answer, really. If they say, no, you can't do this, or I don't think so, I say, watch me, I'll do it. I'll make it happen, I'll make it right. And, uh, you know, betting on that instinct has always paid off. And so, while I truly love my time in the Marine Corps, I can see now um, the spirit, the esprit de corps. So my grandfather served in the Marines, my grandmother was an Army nurse in World War II, and so, their vision of the Marine Corps, I said, that's what I want to do. That's exactly what I want. And that's why I ended up enlisting. Um, but you know, things aren't always what, what it was in, the, in those days. And so um, it gave me so much, uh, so many great friends and experiences. And um, it's really just launched into a whole new, you know, as we transition off active duty and saying, you know, what can I do to inspire the next generation? Because when we talked about earlier is that we need the next generation of Marines to be born and have a desire to serve at, because our national security is at risk because we truly need those people to be attracted to the Marine Corps or the Army or the Air Force, the Navy or the Space Force. So we need those young warriors. And so, um, you know, the line in the movie Saving Private Ryan uh, always gets me when it says, earn this, earn this life. And so what we do and we take from our service after service is, what can I do to inspire the next generation? Well, you know, some veterans feel guilty and have survivor's guilt and not sure where to, where to go and how to turn their life into something of value and make an impact. But I've used that as a calling to say, what, would, what can I do to make the people who lost their lives not be in vain. What can I do to showcase that I feel lucky to be alive, I had a lot of close calls, but what can I do now to earn this life and make it of impact? And so I think the Marine Corps really gave me that and say, I am going to recruit the next generation because I want the next generation to be just as effective. Not only do I want it, we need it as a nation. We need those people to come and join the military. So last Last question to Scott. Um, if you, were, you mentioned millennials and what they want and what they sort of craft their life to be, which is sort of work from home, have gaming this and do that. Are those people ever gonna join the Marines or who, who are the Marines for these days and how do you communicate that to them? I, they're on, on the rails of those ships right now. They're standing at the gates protecting the base. Mm -hmm. They're downrange in countries we don't even know about fighting for us. They're training. Uh, they're millennials. And there's a very small segment of this population, less than one half of 1% of the entire American population, over 333 million people in this country that raise their right hand and swear an oath to defend this country. They're still there and they're still born from great families that, that raise them and educate them and there's this warrior class in every society. It was there with the, the samurai, it was there with the uh, Spartans, it was there with the Apache here in our continent. And every time the, those warriors went out to fight, they protected and defended something that those people that remained behind were either unwilling or un incapable of doing. And when they came back, the difference was is they were welcomed in with open arms because those people understood I could never do what you did. What you had to go through, what you had to see and experience, I 
wasn't able to bear that. And they brought him back in. It was the same people that fed us, that educated us, that raised us, that uh, threw us in detention, all those same people. But there was a different culture. But everybody throughout history, every, every country has had that warrior class. So I think that's a, uh, just something that I'm, I'm constantly reminded of um, as I continue to share what's most important to me about e education uh, of, the, of the younger generations. But those are the same people that are driving the patrol cars around here and, and taking care of us. They're, they're the younger generation, but you got to give back to it. You can't expect it to just happen. Uh, you got to put some skin in the game, it, just like I say. So I think that y you are one of those people that you either do or you talk about doing. Put on TV. All right, we're going to ask yes. the audience if they want to ask any of the authors questions. Um, there's a microphone out there. I can't see very well. But uh, if you want to ask questions, just raise your hand and they'll bring the microphone out to you. Keep in mind that you'll also have some quality time out in the lobby to buttonhole these folks. Um, hi, my question is for Fred. Uh, I have not read your book, but I am familiar with the case. Would you agree there is some place for tribunals or the prosecution of what we would label war criminals, starting with um, the Nuremberg trials, the Tokyo trials, the prosecution of Ceausescu? Well, how, do you, how do you resolve that historical fact with what appears to be protecting the young Marines who were charged in the case from uh, simply following orders? Yes, this is a <clears throat> issue that's one uh, currently is uh, in relations to like sexual assault. A lot of people are discussing whether uh, the military should retain that authority or if it should be turned over to another uh, United States or international authority. And uh, there's there's lots of discussions. Actually, uh, one of the uh, attorneys who defended myself is uh, looking to make these types of re reforms. Uh, uh, we've actually, in, in our cases, you or others may have read, there are, there are individuals out there, um, I'm talking the Amnesty International, International Bar Association, who, because in our case, they didn't use any legal terms. And that's, that is a failure, not from Marines on the front line, but that's a failure of senior leaders in the United States Marine Corps to not use legal terms in the longest standing war crimes trial in the Marine Corps history. Um, they didn't, every other military justice case ends in innocent, guilty, or dismissed. Ours, they stated act, that we acted appropriately. That uh, led to rioting, that led to uh, a lot of sensational headlines, and it led to other organizations for years. The reason I wrote this book is because, I mean, one, I had a gag order placed against me, which is uh, completely un-American a protective order by the commander of the U.S. Central, US Marines Central Command. Um, but the story needed to be told. <clears throat> I don't believe that having some United Nations uh, in, in our particular case is, is the answer, but I do believe that there are avenues in, in the United States having uh, turned certain uh, cases over to civilian courts. Uh, there is unlawful command influence, and uh, no other case, no other courts in the United States have uh, the potential to where a jury is influenced. That their the retention, their promotion, their next assignments are not uh, influenced or coerced by uh, a senior leader, as it currently is in a case right now that I've been advocating of a uh, three special operators in the same command I served in. Uh, and uh, there has been influence in that case, in these, which is currently ongoing. Uh, and there's, you, you look at our case and you read the book, A, A Few Bad Men, and the last half of that book, there's nothing um, about Fred Galvin. That's what it took 11 years to have my efforts to declassify those courtroom testimonies. And that's all it was, is attorneys talking to witnesses. Uh, so. There was no reason, if, if you know enough about 
the case that I was in, it was a gun battle. It was not Jason Bourne's knock list or locations of submarines at sea. This was something that a roadside bomb initiated it and we were shot at on both sides of the street. And to classify that is, uh, is something that if you thought uh, how we do non-combatant evacuation operations where we are obligated to prioritize and evacuate American citizens first and what happened last year, that's not what happened. If you thought that was bad, what happened in our court case and how it was mishandled and covered up, um, I do believe there is necessary reform that needs to take place so that the sons and daughters that are serving today and will serve tomorrow in our military, they will not have some type of injustice and they will not have to look over their shoulders and wonder if if the leadership will have their backs or not. I believe it should be handled by uh, a civilian system that it should be uninfluenced. And I'm talking specifically about capital offense cases. Uh, I'm not talking about what's going on with some minor infraction. I believe that can be handled by the military and it should, but uh, sexual assault cases, that's already been uh, uh, an issue in the past that's been, uh, turned in another direction, I also do believe, but it's going to take the people becoming aware, reading a case like this, this isn't, there's not a bit of fiction in this book, and saying, we can never have this happen again. But unfortunately, right now, if you look, search for the MARSOC 3, there's a case of uh, self-defense, three special operators that are, that are under fire, and they're experiencing a lot of heat, and uh, and I do believe that would have been thrown out if, a, if an attorney did, if a civilian attorney went to try to do what happened last November and threatened eight defense attorneys. Uh, our current system protects that, that allowed that to happen, allowed a Marine attorney with over 25 years to go down from the Pentagon and make those accusations. So I know I get a little um, fired up about this, but I agree partially with you. I think military, U.S. military justice cases needs to be handled by uh, U.S. civilian legal systems uh, when there is something, and I wasn't involved in, uh, <clears throat> in a case as egregious as what happened in Nazi Germany or the allegations were not like that, but uh, that, that is something I really haven't thought about and haven't prepared enough to to answer something like that, but I believe in the United States we need to get away from uh, where it can be as influenced as possible, and, and there needs to be some answers. Somebody, the, the senior most leaders, the fact of the matter is we don't care enough in the United States to uh, think that what happened in the case that I was involved in in a current case is, is important enough to, to even bring uh, general and admiral officers in and demand that a uh, some action be taken, people be held accountable. Uh, we're, we're seeing it right now. You probably saw hearings last year about how we fumbled the withdrawal in Afghanistan and uh, you have a secretary and a chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff that uh, tried to provide some, uh, pardon my technical terms, but bullshit answers to the American people. And uh, <clears throat> there's been no accountability for that. Uh, and one last thing I'll say is chapter 26 of the book talks about how all these people that betrayed us, I'm talking Marion Webster's calls a traitor, somebody who betrays you. Um, that is treasonous. That happened. People betrayed us and they all got promoted. Uh, but what I have seen, that is a short-sighted answer for anybody that thinks it's, it's beneficial to throw somebody on the bus and gain from it. Uh, what I've seen happen, and many of, some of you know, uh, those leaders, what mattered the most to them, whether it's their family, their health, their career, it was all destroyed in the long term. So uh, going after people who are, you knew they were innocent. You had statements of, sworn statements of 30 Americans, my polygraph. You knew what was happening. And you go to Appendix 3 and you read every witness statement from the 75 Afghans. It's just, it's ridiculous. We don't have stupid people that wear four stars on their collar and work in the Pentagon. They knew what the answer was, and they just decided to, to choose this route to go. And uh, when you read that book, 
which I don't encourage you to do after dinner or before bedtime, it will disturb you. And uh, I, I don't like to talk about this. It wasn't my goal to go out and, and write something, but it was a goal to create a, a change in our military. So I know that's a long-winded answer to your question. Hello, John McCoy here from the Oceanside Theater Company. Uh, again, I'd like to welcome everybody here on the dais. Thank you, Robert and Fred and Amy and Scott. So great to have you here in the Brooks Theater. My question is, um, and I was a, a Vietnam era civilian, not in the military, but I do recall when they came back from Vietnam that, it, that the welcome wasn't exactly wonderful here in the United States. Do you see a difference now with these recent um, uh, uh, combats and recent things that, that how America in general, I know there are differences here and there, but America in general are treating our veterans and, and that are coming back, and uh, I just kind of wanted your opinion on that. Question for? Pardon me? Who are you asking the question to? Uh, anybody on the, on the panel, please, or all of you. Yeah, I they're, they're treated much better. And uh, recent history shows us in what happened in Afghanistan was the uh, one more thread in that long rope was woven in that connects us even closer to our Vietnam veterans. And I know there's at least one out there. Dave, where are you at? You still awake? There, where is he? Francine, wake him up. But you know this because of the, the way the events unfolded, and that, that ties us closer to what that generation had to deal with, sadly, I think, um, in most cases. But when Vietnam veterans who were spat on, and we had TV had just come of age, or you know, it had only been out for a while, so that was promulgated, and it was in everyone's face. And I think that since then, some 50 years, later. I mean, that's hard to conceptualize. 50 years. And we're still now welcoming these people home, these warriors that fought intensely. I mean, some really brutal combat. And I think that we have structures and organizations in place, uh, and especially uh, through the nonprofit sector, where we have programs and, and things established that help veterans transition. And, and I think that those make things a little bit easier. Uh, and I think one of the things to that I always like to remind people too is we're not trying to give people something for free. We want to empower our veteran tribe and show them you can be a best-selling author, you can be successful in life, you can do these things, you can start a restaurant. Whatever it is you want to be great at, just be great at it. And we're here to help you and to leverage that network. And we learned those lessons due in large part to our Vietnam vets who suffered those slings and arrows when they came home. Uh, but I think it's also a product, too, of what we see and what we have access to through mainstream media and television and social media especially. And the young lady's question to Fred was important, too, because I think, and we were having this generational discussion about different people in these age groups, whether I make fun of them or not, because I'm the old guy now when I hang around all my Marines. And, um, I think it's important because there were so many worse things going on in World War I, in World War II, these violations of the law of war, basic rule of law. Uh, there were no such thing as rules of engagement. They didn't have those things. But they were hidden, and, and it, was a it wasn't an all-volunteer force, so the training was lack. These people didn't know any better, so they did a lot of stupid stuff under the conditions of war, and they got away with it. But now our young fighting force, even the, the Marines and soldiers we led almost 15 years ago, now it makes us feel even older. They're so much better trained than we were even growing up as young. Can you, better equipped, better trained, better schooling, they're smarter, they grow up faster in the homes when we receive them at age 18, 19 years old. But when something goes bad and it's publicized and we have access to it, we think the problem's heightened. We think it's that much worse. And 
in the same note, it takes a lot of courage to go and fight in Afghanistan. It takes even more courage to do the right thing and for Fred to rip that scab open again and bleed in 300 pages of a book and say, look, I'm trying to do the right thing and in hopes that we are setting the conditions for every generation to not only join the military, but when they have to go out and fight and defend it, they're welcome back home. And again, I think that we do a great job of that. As, no, as I want to interrupt and say something. Um, one of the things that you're, that you're missing that you're good at is that back in the Vietnam era, you had narrative shaped by large publishing houses, by filmmakers. Now everybody owns the media. So you can have podcasts, you can do your own thing, and you can get your own message out. You, I mean, you want to get people to read your book because you want to communicate something. You want to communicate something. You want to communicate something. So if people support people telling their own stories, then you are accepted back because you, you're getting it off your chest and you're trying to motivate people to do something. Um, this is the thing that strikes me over and over again. There, there's a podcast jungle in which almost anybody who was in Iraq and Afghanistan has a podcast, but at least I'm getting that information clearly from that person. So, I mean, this is a very healthy uh, trend, I think. All right, another question. Hi, I'm Susie Schaefer, Finish the Book Publishing, and my question goes to Amy. I wanted to ask, what was, um, what was the moment of validation for you after you published your book that made you realize that you had made the right step? Thank you, Susie. So great to see you. Um, so I took a different route in publishing uh, my book, Heroes Live Here. It's more an independent. I just It's a collection of my photos and stories I put together. And so now with the new world of publishing, anyone can really publish a book if you want to. You don't necessarily need to pitch your manuscript to the large uh, print houses. And so it really opens up a lot of doors for anyone out there in the audience who thinks, can I write, can I do that too? And you certainly can. If I did it, anyone can do it. And so the moment of validation really is being here with you today. Really, this is sort of a full circle. Thank the community. Talk with them about really the love letter to Camp Pendleton and my time there and sitting by these two guys who have, have really um, kind of paved the way as far as book. I got inspired when I came to the Marine Corps birthday in 2020 when you had written a book about Ramadi and I said, well, I was in Ramadi in 2006, and he's got a book, and uh, why can't I write a book? Uh, so, but being a woman and being a, a Marine, you know, getting that support to say, we trust you to tell the story, the important story of uh, the Camp Pendleton and the base and the history here. And so it really means a lot, um, I would say, our, our book signing. And the fact that people actually would pay the, the price point um, for this book, is $49.99 and even at the bookstore I'm really surprised that people would pay that much money but there's a lot of love and dedication that went inside of this to showcase the awesome story of Camp Pendleton and the Marines really and so validating it here being with you tonight on this special day of September 11th 2022 just to really be reflective and understand the tremendous sacrifice of the Marines sailors, soldiers, airmen that I have served with through the years, but then um, collectively put, putting this together. So thank you. My comment is for Amy. And my husband received your book as a birthday gift in July uh, and is a former Marine and is a former Marine wife. We so much enjoyed your book. We loved it. We loved the photos were fabulous, and uh, being able to look at the Marines at Camp Pendleton, it was, it's a fabulous book, and I just wanted to thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. You know, with, it, with that in mind of sharing the courage of the Marines, but not lost on me, obviously, the family members and anyone who's been stationed at Camp Pendleton, it's a, it's a special place, and the, the bond between Oceanside and Camp Pendleton goes back um, 80 years and so anyone who's been stationed there like your husband and just I, I really appreciate that and that um, it's a way to tell the story and encourage the next generation that we we love them we'll support them and we're cheering them on when they decide to step on the yellow footprints and take that uh, oath and continue the legacy of the Marine Corps so thank you 
So my name's Ami Calhoun. I am the daughter of Larry and Linda Grandy, my husband. So my dad is a Vietnam War um, retired Marine. My husband was a Marine. My grandpa was a POW under Patton. So I come from a huge line of um, people that serve the military. I'm heartbroken tonight that this theater is not completely full. So I want to know like what we do as a culture and as a community, like how do we make people want to serve in our country today? Because like it breaks my heart. Like this place should be full. It's it's the 21st anniversary of September 11th. We have so many people that have served. So many of my family have served. Like it's like everybody should be here. So. I don't know what's changed, but like I want to know what like my husband and I need to do as parents and as like as a community to make a difference. If I could just uh, make a couple comments on that, because um, you know I'll give a few examples. When uh, I came back from Desert Storm, I remember coming off the landing craft and in a Humvee, and everybody was you know really cheering us on. It was just coming off of here and circle around the loop to go uh, where we were stationed in, on the base. Just, a, it was awesome. There was that patriotism that was here in Desert Storm. It was still here in the early parts of Iraq. Um, on, these, on these deployments, uh, after a while it went on, we thought, you know, is the free bear gonna end? I mean, sometime this is gonna wear out. And my point on that is eventually, the American public, I believe, gets exhausted, and they see an event that happened last year, um, which is one of multiple events. Um, last summer, before that withdrawal, you had, you know, the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff saying that President Ghani's Afghan National Security Force was going to be able to hold the line, and that they will be able to defend uh, Afghanistan. These assessments had been given out. And, and several of the Marines that I served with from here went on those assessment teams, and that information was distorted. And so we have a series of events, and in, in the military, is, as you have served, and the, the families, you know we have guard, we're supposed to have guardrails, policies, we're supposed to have guard dogs. Those are the leaders that are supposed to be competent and moral. And when those break down or they're removed or you're incentivizing people to distort those facts because that's what an agenda or a party, uh, but we spent 20 years and in, in the American public, we have, has lost some trust. And I would not say it's, it's not the frontline Marines. It's not the ones that fought in Ramadi, you know, in all these battles that, uh, you know, this base, you know, pushed people out for, for 20 years. And, uh, you know, some are in that book, but, uh, there does need to be an outcry from America. There needs to be some organization of, of the American people. <clears throat> you know, that's, that's a complex problem. That's one thing that every chance I have, I'm standing up and stating that, in, in less than two months, you have an ability to make a decision, but it, that starts tomorrow when you can pick up that phone and realize that if that person doesn't get in touch with you as a constituent and answer that question and demand an answer about three special operators right now that are serving, that have been under fire for 43 months, that person has no business being a leader and an elected official in Washington, D.C. for the people of the United States. Uh, but you have so many people that go back there and, and they'll get a letter that's carefully crafted from the, from the Pentagon explaining the, the why of they're doing this or that or the other. But uh, this military was incentivized. And when you look at a lot of these leaders and where they're at now, uh, you had a famous Marine general that most, most people will know, Smedley Butler, who wrote a book, and you understand that he was the muscle that was pushing these wars down in Central America that big business was profiting from, and it is being incentivized to have wars last longer than they should. We won those wars 
and we we decided to stay. We decided to implement a strategy that is a proven failure. Uh, a Marine and Army general decided that we're going to push this counterinsurgency strategy, and that's when it started to to go haywire. Uh, and the American public was was deceived, was duped. But we need people to become active and understand that this is the number one non-discretionary item on the United States federal budget. So if you're paying that much for a house or a car, you better expect it at work effectively. And right now, if you look at what happened last year and what was happening for several of these years before, I would not say that is, was effective and I would not say that was, what was being told by our military leaders to the United States Congress was, was truthful. And there's been no accountability for that. So, you know, people reference these other warrior class generations, the Spartans who are held accountable. We don't hold our senior, but if a, if a Marine in one of these barracks had a seventh can of beer in his barracks, he's going to be held accountable and he's going to be punished swiftly. But what general has been? Uh, so we, we have to get away from, uh, like I was saying today, Barnes & Noble, if, if your favorite sports team had several losing seasons, but let alone for nearly 20 years, there'd, there'd be some accountability with that, with that sports team or a, a publicly traded company. They'd switch the leaders out. But we just promote them all, and we give them careers afterwards working for these, uh, as war pimps for these companies uh, like General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin. Uh, it's something America has to care more about our military, more than sports and, and these publicly traded companies that they're invested in. Uh, that's, that's where our focus is at right now, and it needs to change to uh, this threat that's brewing over in uh, the East China Sea. Because we're going to send a lot of Americans there at a point in time, and it's going to be ugly. You, everyone needs to, yes, everyone has to get active and has to say, you have to contact your, I mean, this is what I say every single time I'm allowed to get it in front of a microphone, is you have to, you have to engage your member of Congress. And, and how do you do that? You contact them, and then you don't vote for them if they don't demand an answer. They have to bring a service chief in front of a committee and demand an answer. The fact that a year ago, and I was watching this this morning, and it was just making me sick to my stomach that it, a secretary and a service and the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff were, were given some bullshit answers uh, to Congress, to the Senate and the House Armed Services Committee. And, and we, we've allowed that. So in a little over a month and a half, you have a chance, but you have a chance tomorrow to figure out if that person that is, is up there campaigning should be the person that uh, is leading everybody here in, in Congress. Encouraged. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there's probably 50, 55 people here tonight. Um, I think we sold tickets to 80 plus people. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, over the course of my career, I could teach Marines to do a lot of things. I could teach them how to run fast or shoot the rifle straighter. Um, I could teach people how to write a book now. Uh, I, I don't do math in public still. But there's one thing I could never teach people, and I could never teach people to care. You just can't teach that. And you guys coming here tonight and, and supporting this event shows me that you care. And I think when you share that message um, and, and get active and become involved, I think that that's an important thing because that's really something that you, as someone that's in the military tribe, being, you know, generationally, you've been doing it for so long, you get it. And even people that serve, there's a lot of cool things that recruiters sell us in, uh, in the day you go in that office and it's all decorated, they got their medals, and the, man, there's some good salesmen. They could sell a popsicle to an Eskimo, and uh, it's, it's nuts, and you become enamored with this, and they teach you all these things throughout your career, and they've got all of these fabulous posters about leadership traits and principles and all these great things, and uh, you know, the really great people that I've experienced in my life, and, and, and a lot of them are here today, they understand that it's not those words that are listed in the, in the locker rooms or the, the barracks of, of leadership traits, but they, they learn how to read in between the lines as great leaders. And it's words like love and compassion and caring and understanding. And those words aren't written in the books 
in schoolhouses that professional warriors attend because those words seem to make us weak. And it is the antithesis of that mask that we wear as professional warriors and fighters. But I submit that it's really those words that people subscribe to that really make the greatest leaders. And I think that that carries with you long after you leave the military and you show up on a Sunday night to just take a minute of your time to remember uh, what we're here for tonight and, and to share that. So it's a, great, it's a great question, but I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over what can we do more of. I think that you're doing it. You're a great example. I think if you share that with just one other person, that's one more person than many people will ever do, and you're making a difference. Well, we can notch it up a bit. So we talked about how podcasts and self-publishing and sort of control of media allows people to directly communicate. You as an individual have social media at your fingertips. Uh, you may have one follower, you may make one post, but you can also bring other people into that conversation. So if, if you're moved by what Fred says, if you read his book and you read the news about what's happening and you communicate those facts to people, br bring them into the conversation and state your concern or your interest, whether they be journalists, politicians, uh, influencers or whatever, you do shift the conversation slightly. Now, you know, we're all worried about what size Kim Kardashian's bum is and who's on TV, <laughs> but sometimes people want to be serious. They want to get into something that they can physically change or do good. And there has been a lot of injustice. There are a lot of people telling stories. There's a lot of people with a lot of needs that they just want to reach out to people. Don't discount the use of social media and bringing in other people into the conversation. You might find there's a lot of people that share what you believe in or what you want to change. So don't feel you're isolated. You don't have a voice. You do have a voice. And it's not about the number of followers you have. It's about the quality of those people. So there may not be 200 seats filled here, but these are 55 of the best people in Oceanside right here in the surrounding areas. So that's something I take seriously. Uh, even as somebody that, you know, wants to get a story told, and, and you have to share the story if you want people to read it. You could write the best book in the world and have experienced the greatest things, but if you're not willing to share it and promote it and, and understand that that's a part of being a writer is getting that message broadcast from the loudest speaker. A lot of people don't do that. And to, to them, I say, great, go sit in your grandmother's basement and write the next best novel. No one will ever read it. It'll be great to you and your grandma. So it takes a lot of, a lot of courage to, to get out there and do it. But you have that capacity as well, right here from your phone. That's the beauty of technology. Robert's absolutely right. So let me take it back. Because when we, when we started, we talked about people having stories, stories shaping people's lives, ideas, goals, opinions. Um, you're listening to three people tell things they feel passionately about. These are real stories that can cut through a lot of the clutter. So, but I, I do want to thank them for coming here, and I do want to thank Amy with her magic skills, ninja organizational skills, and Scott with his very powerful public speaking and communication. Sorry, Amy. And I just encourage you to, to keep feeding that animal that feels a sense of injustice or a need to communicate or support or help, because that's what powers us all. There's powerful stories and powerful actions. So uh, just a round of applause for our, our authors. They'll be out also signing and selling books, as you probably figured out. But I'd like to also re remind people there, there's still food out there. It was uh, provided by Bastard's Canteen, Nick Velez, who is actually in my book. He's my partner with Save the Brave. Uh, please, if, don't feel shy. Take food home with you. Otherwise, I'm going to be eating rib tips for two weeks, and I can't <laughs> afford to do that uh, past age 50. It's no longer a bargain. So please take food. There's also t-shirts from Save the Brave. If you don't have cash, great. Go to savethebrave.org, make a donation. I trust you. Um, donate whatever you want. Uh, feel free. We've got a whole bag of t-shirts out there. Pick your color. And um, I, I do want to say a special thank you to Amy uh, as well, because she was uh, the one that organized this. It's a, a wonderful group with varying opinions and, and experiences. And thank you for doing that. And I, as a friend and a fellow warrior, you, you made this happen. And thanks to everybody again for coming out tonight.